Two balls and a strike to count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. It's his way back. Walk the ball. Chris Taylor. What's up, everybody? Welcome into Dodger Heads presented by DodgerBlue.com. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined today by Matt Moreno. And Matt, if we thought that the Dodgers and baseball were going to wait until the beginning of August to start talking trades, we were sorely mistaken because today John Morosi dropped this bombshell on Twitter uh, earlier. Um, sources, Dodgers and Reds have had preliminary trade conversations about right-handed pitcher Luis Castillo. Many clubs are showing interest in Castillo, of course, Long way to go before August 2nd trade deadline, but Dodgers are definitely involved. I misspoke. So this this came out Monday. This rumor uh, was reported. When you saw this, Dodgers showing interest in Castillo, preliminary trade conversations, were you surprised? What was your reaction? Definitely not surprised at all. It was kind of what I uh, expected would be the case at some point before the trade deadline. Obviously, we're still you know about three weeks away from there. Uh, under Andrew Friedman, we've seen the Dodgers, you know, sort of kick the tires on a bunch of different scenarios, uh, whether it's just initial kind of cursory trade talks or something more serious uh, to obviously completing blockbuster trades. And for me, you know, I know you and I sort of differ in the opinion. Uh, I think the Dodgers need to trade for a starting pitcher at the deadline. And so when you kind of looking at it from that lens, I sort of thought, you know, this was bound to happen at some point. Yeah, it's an interesting one, and I'll get into in a moment whether or not the Dodgers need a starting pitcher. But let's look at Castillo, the player, briefly. Played with Cincinnati his entire career. He's in his age 29 season. He's arbitration eligible next year for the final time, and then will be a free agent in 2024. He's in the midst of a very good season, the best season of his career. In fact, 12 starts, 2.92 ERA, a FIP of 3.03. If you look back over the past three seasons, his ERA has sat in the threes. Last year, 3.98, 3.21 the year before that, 3.40 the year before that. It's worth noting, by the way, the durability of Castillo. 31 starts in 2018, 32 starts in 2019. He makes all 12 starts in the short in 2020, 33 starts in 2021, and then 12 starts thus far this season. So he's missed a little bit of time this year, but on the whole of his career, again, age 29 season and still... Um, has been pretty consistent from a health perspective. You look at the stat cast numbers. Again, I would say um, these are a little underwhelming for who I think Castillo is. Um, on the upside, 83rd percentile for bail rate. He's in about the 70th-ish percentile for a lot of the expected numbers. His exit velocity, hard hit, 46, 48 percentile. So right around league average. But when I watch Castillo, every time he seems to pitch against the Dodgers, he's nasty. Fastball, one of the better fastballs in baseball, mixes in a changeup. Um, I was looking at some of the stat cast stuff. The changeup, incredibly effective in 2018 and 19. Um, this was a, a pitch that was 28 runs better than average in the league in 2019. But that number has come way down. It was three runs better last year, and it is actually one run below average thus far this season. So not entirely sure there, but... Castillo, the pitcher, we can get into the, do the Dodgers need a starter? Where does Castillo, the pitcher, sort of rank? Is he one of the 10 best pitchers in baseball? Is he one of the 25 best pitchers in baseball? Is he a number one starter? Is he a number three starter? How do you think about Luis Castillo? It's tough. I'm kind of with you. You know, I think you hear the name, and if you've seen him pitch against the Dodgers, you would think that he's, you know, this frontline ace, absolutely dominating everybody. But then, like you just touched on some of the numbers, they're good, but not necessarily great. And, you know, it, it, so it's tough to sort of say, you know, where where he is. He's obviously a number one type caliber pitcher with the Reds. On the Dodgers, assuming full health, I think he's more of a two or three, which is perfectly fine. I mean, they're not your everyday team like we've talked about. Even, you know, if you want to look at their position players, there are several guys who are, you know, maybe coming off the bench or in sort of a platoon situation that would be starting for a lot of other teams across baseball. Uh, that being said, you know, I think he is a very good pitcher. I think the Dodgers have also shown an ability to – tap into you know either a pitch mix or a specific uh arm slot or usage whatever they may when they be change that and then elevate a pitcher and so if we've seen them do it with different relievers who you know maybe are kind of toiling with potentially ending up in triple a instead of really sticking at the major league level if they were to do that if they were to get their hands on castillo with his potential his uh floor already is higher than some of the other examples some of their other success stories in the past I think it would only be positive things moving forward. 
Yeah, it's a great point. Just looking through fan graph stuff, he was 19th in wins above replacement among pitchers back in 2019. He was 6th among pitchers in 2020, 21st last year in 2021. Of course, this year has missed a little bit of starts. Um, so I think he's a back-end number one starter, I think is a fair assessment. And I think you make a great point that we are both of the belief that if you the Dodgers get the guy in the system, then the changeup is going to improve. The secondaries are going to improve. They're going to be able to do some things, whether it's even shifting guys behind him, to improve all of the numbers, all of the metrics, which leads us to the final question about a guy like Castillo, which is the cost. The cost you imagine is going to be high. Again, this is a guy who's 29 and a half years old. He's got one more of team control, uh, year of team control left after this one. Um, his current contract is friendly. I believe he's getting paid around seven, $7.35 million this year. That number will go up, but it's not going to be in the $20 million range you would imagine. Probably 10 to $12 million is what he'll make next year. So cost-controlled starting pitcher who's very good. And then you look at the Dodgers. Everywhere you look, they have top prospects. I think Baseball America came out with a new list on Monday. They had seven guys in the top, like, 80 prospects or something like that. They had six guys on MLB.com's latest update. So then the question is, who gets dealt? Um, I'm pretty safe in feeling like Bobby Miller is untouchable. Diego Cartaya is untouchable. Then you get <laughs> a little bit further down the list, and you start to wonder if those are the types of players, Andy Pajes, Miguel Vargas, Michael Bush, Ryan Pepio, Eddie's Leonard, Nick Nestrini, those are the types of players that I think begin to be in play. Would the Dodgers move Pepio as the centerpiece in a Luis Castillo deal? Would they move a guy like Michael Bush as a centerpiece in a Luis Castillo deal? What do you think? Like, are the Dodgers going to be, I don't think they're going to move Miller or Cartaya. I think Vargas personally is probably off limits. Pajes is a guy they've tried to trade once, but he has skyrocketed since then. So maybe they've learned that lesson or maybe they're still not high on him. Would you be willing to pay the price for Luis Castillo? It's tough because I I think obviously a player of his caliber, you're going to have to give up you know substantial prospects anyway. But I think especially this year where it's sort of shaping that Castillo and Frankie Montas are going to be you know arguably the best starting pitchers available. Yeah. And so the Reds are sitting from an even better position than yeah. maybe they normally would be to begin with. And so when you factor all that in, you know I don't know how much the Dodgers would really want to tap into their cupboard. Uh, if they do, I think fortunately they do have depth on the pitching prospect side. You know maybe somebody like Michael Grove, just because I'm not sure. You know, we have we did see him up this season, obviously, but in terms of where he ranks and compares to some of their other prospects and the ceiling, I don't know if the Dodgers are maybe as high on him as they are some of their other uh, young pitchers. Yeah. From the position player side, you know, I'd be I'd be surprised if they really tap into that just because like we've talked about on several other shows, you know, we we've seen kind of their lack of depth on yeah. that side hurt them when injuries have kind of, you know, set in and. That still is sort of the case this year. It's a little bit better now, but, you know, I, I'd be shocked if they really, you know, went heavy on position players to get a trade, uh, position player prospects to get any sort of trade done. Yeah, because you look at a guy like Miguel Vargas. I mean, he seems to be the heir apparent to Justin Turner, who is, you know, in the last year of his contract. You've got a guy like Michael Bush, who could be sort of a replacement of sorts for Trey Turner. He doesn't play the same position shortstop, but does that mean Gavin Lux or Chris Taylor or somebody moves over to shortstop and Michael Bush plays a little second base or he plays a little bit of left field? <clears throat> Here's what I would say. Here's the deal I'd be interested in making if I was the Dodgers. We've talked about this on a number of shows. We've got a trade deadline preview that will be coming out shortly, and I mentioned this. One thing that, that I keep trying to harp on every time we talk about trades is the Dodgers have an overabundance of guys that are either on the 40-man roster or need to be added to the 40-man roster next year. They had five guys added at the beginning of this season to protect them from a Rule 5 draft that never ended up having happening. They then added Ryan Pepio to that list as well. And then you've got Cartaya, Pajes, Vargas, Bush, and Jose Ramos, all five in the top nine prospects within the organization, according to our friend Justin Lorber, who need to be added. That's in addition to Outman, Grove, Pepio, Vivas, Jackson, Amaya, Leonard, McKinstry, guys who are already on the list. So I count about 13 guys that are not quite major league level players yet. You know, obviously Andre Jackson, Zach McKinstry, sort of the exception to that rule, who will need to be on the 40-man roster or be lost for nothing at the beginning of next year. And so I wonder if the Dodgers can go to a team like the Reds. And obviously, this is going to sound like a poo-poo platter, and maybe it is, but just say, hey, we're actually not going to give you one of our top guys. We're not going to give you Vargas or Pajes or Bush or Pepio. Those, those, the top five guys are off limits. But can, can they attract them with a Michael Grove, Andre Jackson, 
James Outman, Jacob Amaya, uh, <coughs> those types, Jose Ramos, those types of players who are in the 6 to 15 range organizationally and say, how many do you want? You want four of these guys? You want five of these guys? And say, we're going to give you quantity over quality because, again, the Dodgers have to do something with these guys or else they risk losing them for nothing or getting 25 cents on the dollar when they're in a desperate position to unload some of these guys for other lower level prospects. So for me, that would be the overall approach. What do you think about something like that? Yeah, that's definitely a great point. I guess I just don't know if the Reds would necessarily go for that. And yeah. obviously it's tough to, we can sort of speculate and maybe give educated guesses, but if, you know, the, I think the Yankees or the Blue Jays have been linked to uh, Castillo as well. And so if the Blue Jays come in and say, well, yeah, we'll give you, you know, our number two prospect and X, Y, and Z for Castillo, then, you know, at that point, obviously you need to then do some sort of cross evaluating if you're the Reds. Well, okay, where does this number two prospect for the Blue Jays fall? Maybe overall, obviously, and, you know, compared to the Dodgers number five prospect, because depending on the organizational depth and talent, like it could be just about even, right? Like just because a prospect is ranked higher in one organization doesn't necessarily mean they're a better player than, you know, the number four or five prospect in another franchise, obviously. So that would definitely get interesting. Uh, I, I just, my, my gut tells me that that kind of approach where the Dodgers say, hey, we'll give you a lot, you know, more bulk uh, than maybe top end value would work for another trade where maybe you're getting like, a number two or three type starter, which, like I've said before, I think is still fine. Uh, but yeah, it'd be definitely interesting to see if I'm sure Andrew Friedman, you know, he's he's definitely he's creative. We've seen three team trades, obviously, in the past. And, you know, maybe we can't rule that out as well. Uh, I'm sure he'll try, you know, every sort of avenue to sort of get a trade done if he thinks it'll help the team. Yeah. And I mean, of course, the thing to remember about the Dodgers is once you get outside of their top six, there are some places that have number seven in the top 100 prospects in all of baseball. And so the Dodgers number seven prospect is not the same thing as, you know, the Giants number seven prospect or whoever else, the Diamondbacks number seven prospect as well. Last thing to note, you've hinted at it. My my reasoning for not including the, the one of the top six guys is both because I like those guys as prospects and thinks there's a future there, but also I just don't think the Dodgers are that desperate for a starting pitcher. I think if I look at, I believe in Tony Gonsolin as a guy that can maintain some semblance of what we're seeing. I believe in Tyler Anderson as a guy who can maintain some semblance of what we're seeing. I think Kershaw's health is a legitimate question, but I what he's done has been fantastic. Julio Urias has proven that this is not a fluke, what he has been able to do thus far this season. So those four guys, and then I've got Walker Bueller theoretically back at some point, Dustin May theoretically back at some point, Andrew Heaney theoretically back at some point, Mitch White has been pitching well, Ryan Pepio has improved every time he started, Bobby Miller, the top guy, pitched in the exhibition game right before the season and has looked good at every level. So I just think you start stacking those and saying, is it really worth giving up one of our top six prospects for a pitcher who like would <coughs> would clearly improve the team, but it feels marginal to me. Like if Luis Castillo comes in and replaces Tyler Anderson ultimately in the rotation once Walker Bueller is back, is that really worth giving up, you know, seven years of team control over a guy who's one of your top five prospects? For me, the answer would be no. So that's why I would say, hey, here's the deal. We'll give you our seven, eight, nine, and 10 ranked prospects for Luis Castillo. And if not, then I'm fine. I like the way my roster sits. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a catch-22. I, I agree with you. Like, I don't know if I would touch any of the top-end prospects in the organization to get this trade done. I think still taking a you know step back, half a step back, however you want to look at it, I think the Dodgers stand to benefit from adding a starting pitcher just because it, it'll give you more margin for air. And, yeah. you know, I feel, yes, the message has been Walker Buehler will be back, but still that's probably not happening until September. And then at that point, he's going to have three or four weeks to sort of get ready for the playoffs. And who knows how that's going to go. Yeah. Dustin May, you know, he will be back. He's projected to be back before Bueller, obviously, but he's going to be coming off basically missing a full year and then Tommy John surgery. So I think adding Castillo and then also, you know, like you said with Gonsolin, you know, I, I think what we've seen, he can definitely sustain, even if there's a little bit of regression, he'll still be at a very pitching at a very elite yeah. level. Uh, my concern with him, though, would be he's also going to start brushing up against uh, blowing. He's going to by the end of the year, he's going to blow way past his yeah. uh, career innings. He'll set a new career high. So is yeah. there going to be fatigue? And then does he become less effective in the playoffs? And Andrew Friedman has already come out and said he doesn't like trading for relief pitchers at the trade deadline just because he feels the value is so thrown off. Yeah. So I think if you add a starting pitcher, 
we've already seen, you know, Dustin May can go into the bullpen in October. Yeah. We've already seen him do that. If they do it with Tyler Anderson as well. And then also, you know, what if Blake Trent, what if something goes wrong with Blake Trent? What if Tommy Canley isn't ready? What yeah. if, you know, Caleb Ferguson sort of struggles or whatever the case may be? I just think you're better off adding as much talent as possible to your pitching staff and then figuring out, okay, starter, reliever down the line. Let me ask you last question. Where does Luis Castillo but comes to the Dodgers? What number starter is he come playoff time? Ooh, that's t- are we assuming health for everybody? Yeah, assuming assuming they've got the the you know and let, uh, let's say the guy the current rotation that they have right now. So Bueller, May, those guys aren't a part of it. Are not a part of it. Not a part of it. So I'm just saying right now okay. you've got Kershaw, you've got Urias, you've got Gonsolin, you've got Anderson. Where does where does Luis Castillo slot into that that group of four? I think he's probably fourth. So this is my point, right? Like, like <laughs> where where's if Bueller comes back, he's lower, and if Bueller's right. any good, if you know. So this is the fourth guy. How many times does a fourth starter appear as a starting pitcher in the playoffs? That's definitely a fair question, but I would also argue that sometimes the Dodgers have been forced into not using their fourth starter because he hasn't been a great option and they've been, you know, facing elimination or really, you know, kind of needing a semi must win situation. And so I think if you can go into the playoffs with four, you know, quality starters that you trust and then you figure the rest out after that. They already got four. Tyler Anderson, baby. And then whatever I, mean, I can get out of Dustin May and whatever I can get out of Walker Bueller. This is my point. Mitch, like, I think between Bueller, Heaney, May, Pepio, Bobby Miller, those five, you say, if one of those five neat guys needs to be my number four starter, it, like Anderson plus one of those, the, throw Anderson into that group, that group of six. I need one of them to be my number four starter in the postseason. I'm fine with it. And there's no way we're losing all like we're not gonna lose all six of those guys. Right. right. So we'll see. I, I'm a I'm a go trade for relievers. Package these prospects and go get me the two best relief pitchers on the market. But we'll see. Again, just a rumor right now. John Morosi saying the Dodgers and Reds have had preliminary talks around Luis Castillo, a trade. Again, here we are about three weeks away from the trade deadline. That's Matt Moreno. My name is Jeff Spiegel. As always, we appreciate you joining us. Check out DodgerBlue.com for all the latest. And of course, make sure you subscribe right here. Ring the notification bell so that if a deal does get made, either with the Dodgers or somebody else, you'll be the first to find out about it right here. We appreciate you joining us. We'll see you next time.